All right, good morning. My name is Todd Myers. I'm the Environmental Director at the Washington Policy Center. Thank you for sticking around. We're going to talk about the number of environmental policies that are going to come up in this legislative session. Um, as you can tell already by the news, environment is going to be a big issue in the upcoming session, so we're going to talk about uh, the range of issues that we'll be facing. Um, a lot of times uh, in, in Washington State, we constantly talk about the environment, but nothing very much seems to get done. It's why me as a Mariners fan saying, wait till next year, I'm very comfortable in the environmental arena because it seems to always be wait until next year. Before we start, I want to go over a little bit about what the Washington Policy Center, our approach to environmental policy from a high level approach and then you can look at, you can uh, hear what our speakers, when they talk about individual issues and how we try to apply that and make a difference on the ground. And one of the things that I always uh, tell folks is, is that it, it, conservatives need to be more outspoken on their concern for the environment. Because if you look at the map and you look where nature is, the people who live near nature tend to be the ones who support free market ideas. And the environmentalists, the ones who say that they care about nature, have tended to cloister themselves in places where there's mostly concrete and everything is paved over. And it's sort of backwards about who talks about the environment and who lives near the environment. And the thing is, is that what that means is, is that conservatives and people who believe in the free market need to say publicly what they live privately. The challenge, though, oftentimes is that conservatives are afraid to say that because they're afraid that if they say, yes, we are concerned about the environment, what baggage that carries with it. And so what I want to talk about today is how we can, the things that we can do to support environmental effectiveness and environmental policy, the things that we live every day, but we're sometimes afraid to say publicly. Right now, when there's an environmental problem, who do we always call? We always call bureaucracy. We always call for regulation. We're often told that without the bureaucracy without government intervention that environmental problems simply won't get solved. And it sort of reminds me of the, the old saying that uh, the man who says it can't be done should get out of the way of the woman who is doing it. We're always told that if you can't, that you can't do it without government. But that's actually not the case and the result is, is that we go to regulation that is the most expensive and least effective way to solve environmental problems. And so the example that I have up on the screen is the governor's climate bill. Um, and more than 40 times in his piece of climate legislation, it has the phrase, the Department of Ecology shall. All of the power is given the Department of Ecology to determine the, uh, all of the various ways that he's going to address carbon, which means that if you're voting on the piece of legislation, you really don't know what you're voting for because ultimately ecology will make all of those critical decisions. The fact, though, is, is that the best environmental solutions don't come from bureaucracies. They come from people who have a stake in the game who are on the ground. And so I chose this um, because I'm a beekeeper and I know something about this. And people hear about colony collapse disorder and the fact that honeybees are dying and the mortality is increasing. In fact, the mortality was increasing until about 2006, 2007. And since then, as you can see on the chart, it has been going down. And the reason is, is that beekeepers, if their bees die, they don't make money. And it's only recently that politics has gotten involved in this and people blame pesticides and a variety of other things. But beekeepers have already been figuring out a way to reduce the risk of their bees and solve the problem. It's because the people on the ground, when you're dealing with resources and the environment, have the best knowledge and the best ability to come up with those solutions. And that's where we should put the power when we're trying to solve environmental problems with the people who have the most information and have the most control. And so from a, from a standpoint of the Washington Policy Center and those who believe in the free market, we advocate a three-step approach to solving problems. The first is a property rights and cooperative solution. Now what I'm going to assume here in all of these is that there is a general agreement that this is a problem. Oftentimes in environmental problems or environmental issues, we fight about whether there's even a problem in the first place. And that fight is separate from what I'm talking about here today. But if we all agree that it's a problem, such as putting pollution into a stream like sewage or things like that, where we say, yes, this is a problem, it's having an impact, what can we do about it? Right. Conservatives fundamentally believe that you have the freedom to do what you want, but you have to take responsibility for the impact you cause. Okay. The same is true with pollution. 
If you're causing impact, you need to take responsibility. And the question is, how do you reduce it in the best way? So the first is a property rights approach. Eleanor Ostrom, who was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics, looked around the world about how people solve what are called tragedies of the commons, when there's no clear property rights, such as fishing in the ocean. If you leave a fish in the ocean because you want it to reproduce and be there next year, it doesn't work because the fishing boat behind you will just catch that fish. There's no incentive for you to save that resource for next year because you don't control it. Okay. So she looked at how people did this, how they solved these, and what she found was that cooperative solutions were more effective and they were easier to enforce. Because rather than being enforced from somebody from the outside who was always had a limited understanding of the industry or, or, or the inside and the tricks that get played, if you have a cooperative group of people working together, they know to watch each other and they have an incentive to do it and enforce the rules and it works very well. And a good example is the fishing industry in Alaska where the ground fish where they allocated property rights to each of the fishing boats. And instead of saying you have three days to catch as many fish as you possibly can, go out there, come hell or high water, literally, risk death, risk impact, all of those sorts of things. Here's how many fish that you can catch. We don't care when you catch them. And if you don't want to catch them, you can sell your rights to somebody else who will catch them that year. And what this chart shows is that instead of fishing gear being geared toward catching as many fish as possible, whether it's the fish you're targeting or not, they were able to change the gear so that it targeted the fish they wanted and the amount of what's called bycatch, which are fish that you're not supposed to be catching, went way down. Because simple, the simple incentives allowed them to target the fish they wanted rather than just trying to scoop up as many as they could in a very short period of time. We went from a regulatory approach to a property rights approach and it worked very well. And I can tell you that even high school students understand this because I was teaching a class uh, in environmental economics and I had high school students and I gave them all little goldfish crackers and said, okay, we're gonna have three rounds. In the first round, you catch as many fish as you can from the goldfish if there are any goldfish left, they'll reproduce and be there for the next round. Okay? And then whoever gets the most fish gets an iTunes gift card. For high school students, that's like crack. <laughs> so you, I gave them a strong incentive to catch as many fish. And in the first round, do you know how many fish each of them caught? One. They all took one fish. Because they wanted to leave those fish for next turn. Because they were all watching each other and they had worked out a cooperative agreement amongst them for the long term. It was a powerful reminder that when you have a small group of people who work in a cooperative agreement, they can solve these sorts of problems. That doesn't always work though. Sometimes you have way too many people. The impact is dispersed, it's lots of little impacts rather than a few people in the area. And when you have that, it's not always easy to get a cooperative agreement or a property rights agreement. So you can go to the second approach, which I call the market approach, which is sort of a Milton Friedman approach. So what Milton Friedman said is, is that you put a price on the impact you cause, that gives you a disincentive to, to, uh, to create more impact. And the example he gave was of national parks, right? Rather than have everybody pay for the national parks, you have the people who go to the national park pay a user fee, go in to maintain that national park. We've done this with ozone depleting chemicals. We put a tax on them and you can see what the uh, chart there is that it actually shows that, um, I'll stop my timer, that it actually shows that ozone depleting chemicals went down after they put the tax on it. That's when you have a larger number of folks who are causing the impact. And if that doesn't work, then you can go to regulation as a last resort. This tends to be the first resort that we turn to now, even though many of the regulators themselves admit that it is the most expensive and least effective. The EPA has said in the coal regulations on the coal plants that they're proposing right now, they actually said this is an extremely expensive way to do this. We would rather have Congress do other climate policies. They tried to use that as a lever to get a different climate policy. So even they know that it's a, the worst way to do it. And yet, it's the one that's most comfortable to them because they have all the power and they have all the control, like the governor's proposing with the cap and trade bill. But it's not always bad, and there are some examples of where it's good. It worked very well when we found that there was lead in the air. We took lead out of gasoline, and the, the amount of lead, as you can see in this chart, went dramatically down. 
We did the same thing in Washington State with copper brake pads. They found that copper, little bits of copper from brake pads got into the water and made it so that salmon couldn't smell an alert pheromone that would tell them there was danger. And so as a result, when there was an orca sneaking up behind them and the other salmon released the pheromone, they were oblivious. Right? So we banned copper brake pads because there were good alternatives. It doesn't always work. There's not always good alternatives. Sometimes it's the most offensive way. My only point is, it's not always a bad way, but it should be the last resort rather than the first resort. So that's the approach we take. I always put up this map to say, look at where the nature is, and look where free market advocates live. We should be proud to say that we care about the environment, and I understand the concern that if you say that, that you are just encouraging more bureaucracy, but if we provide alternatives, then we can publicly say the values that we privately live because we live near nature. So with that, we now can look at a number of the issues that are gonna be in this legislative session. And so I wanna first uh, bring up to the podium Senator Doug Erickson. Senator Erickson is chair of the Environment Committee. Um, he has been, this is your third year that you've been chair, correct? Fourth year. Third year. Third year. Uh, who just won re-election, and he's gonna to talk to us a little bit about uh, the issues that he'll be tackling in the upcoming session. Please welcome Senator Erickson. Hey, thank you all for coming out today. I know we have a lot of competition in the room next door with uh, Senator Hill and Representative Carlisle, so I appreciate you coming over here. We'll try to keep it a bit entertaining also, because I know those two guys will be very entertaining uh, in what they're talking about. First off, this is a solution summit, and uh, what I want to focus in on are solutions that we'll be looking at next year. And one of the things I like to highlight to folks is when you come to my office and you meet with me as chair of the Energy Committee, um, if the solution you're bringing to me to fight global warming is the same solution you brought back in the 1970s to fight global cooling, I don't really don't want to hear it. So as we move forward in Washington State, we have to be looking at solutions that actually address the problems that we're facing today, not simply rehash ones about a goal people would like to achieve that's outside of uh, what we're trying to get done in Washington State uh, for energy independence. Um, one of the other things, if you come to my office this year, you'll see a bumper sticker on my door that says one half of a bad idea is not a good idea. And so one of the problems we get into in Olympia when you talk about compromise is you'll have somebody who puts an idea or a solution out over here, and then for some reason we feel compelled to reach a compromise that somehow takes one half of that bad idea and try and make it not as bad. And that's some of the mentality we have to move away from in the upcoming legislative session where I believe we have solutions that we can put on the table that are good ideas. They aren't making bad ideas less bad. They aren't making things that are gonna penalize citizens, penalize them slightly less. They are solutions and goals and ways that we can move forward in Washington State that'll benefit the economy, they'll benefit our environment, and they're gonna benefit the individual citizens. Um, I am a chair of the Energy Committee. I also represent Whatcom County in the State Senate. And uh, in Whatcom County, we have two oil refineries, an aluminum smelter, enough gas-fired turbines to power $500,000 homes. We provide all the energy to Seattle City Light through our hydroelectric dams. And we are the hub where pipelines come into Washington State. So we are an industrial energy producing center in Whatcom County. But if you go look at the stats, we're also the seventh most desirable environmental place to live in the entire United States. So think about that one for a second. We have a lot to be proud of in Washington State about the solutions we have already put on the table of how to be a world leader on how to do it right. How to have energy protect production, how to have low cost energy solutions, and how to protect our environment and be the place where people want to live all at the same time. That's what we should be building upon going forward, not penalizing citizens with excessive regulation to achieve some goal that may or may not actually improve our environment. So a couple of the big bills you'll see coming through the Senate this year, um, energy independence will be the focus of the committee this year, done safe and done right. And so the first couple of weeks of the legislative session, we'll be moving out oil by rail legislation to make sure that uh, we in Washington State are taking advantage of the North American energy boom, but also making sure that we're doing it safely to protect the citizens uh, in Washington State. They have that expectation. And as I traveled the state this last year, I go to Spokane, elevated rail line through downtown Spokane carrying Bach and Crude. We have to make sure we're doing it safely. You come to Ferndale where I live and where my kids go to school, there's an elevated rail track through downtown Ferndale. Same exact thing. And so whether you're in Spokane, where you enter Washington State or whether you're in Ferndale, Washington, the final town, those trains pass through on the way to the refineries at Cherry Point, safety is job one, and that's what we're focused in on going forward in Washington State, how we can do that. 
one of the conundrums we run into in terms of a bad idea, half a bad idea not being a good idea, is the executive branch, uh, many of the solutions that they're putting forward require the price of gasoline to be about $4 to $4.50 a gallon for their solutions to work. And so low cost North American crude all of a sudden is making their solutions not very fiscally viable moving forward. And that's one of the challenges that they face because I think the citizens of Washington State are realizing $1.99, Washington State you're currently paying for a gallon of gas, puts a lot of money back into the pocket, puts a lot of money back into the economy, and it's good for Washington State overall. Same thing with electricity. One of the great advantages we have in Washington State is our low-cost hydroelectricity, something we should celebrate, take advantage of, and market worldwide, not something that we should try to um, artificially regulate out of existence with higher energy costs would somehow put our manufacturing jobs at risk. One of the things that we'll keep talking about is we should be marketing Washington State. If you want to build a widget and you care about carbon production, you can produce a, a widget in Washington State with a lower carbon footprint than pretty much anywhere else in, in the United States. And that should be a selling point that we're taking out there and highlighting businesses to bring more manufacturing jobs into Washington State. Now, I think the story of the year uh, might not be cap and trade, it might not be carbon tax. I think the story of the year is going to be the low cost of oil and how that impacts policy decisions both at the state level, at the national level, and at the international level. To me, this is an absolutely phenomenal story that we're paying very close attention to uh, in terms of what's happening with the OPEC countries, what's happening with $50 a barrel uh, oil, how that impacts our economy, how that impacts production in North America, all of these things, how it impacts Keystone Pipeline, how it impacts crude by rail. This, I think, is going to be one of the driving stories going forward, why it's happening, uh, is it long term, and what will be the impacts of it. One of the impacts we'll be dealing with next year is what's called the hazardous substance tax. And the HST is a tax that's charged on oil as it comes into Washington State. Um, it's, a, it's a tax on a barrel that we pay as a percentage uh, that comes in. So when we're $100 a barrel, we're bringing in about $400 million of biennium. If we're at $50 a barrel, you can see the reduction. And we use these MOTCA funds to clean up contaminated sites throughout Washington State. So if you want to be wonky this year, if you're in the construction industry, if you're in the economic development world, one of the main focuses of our committee this year is going to be to tear down the entire MOTCA budget uh, down to basically bare studs and rebuild it up with the focus upon finally cleaning up toxic sites all throughout Washington State, creating jobs, by the way, on the front end with the cleanup, and then putting those properties back into effective economic redevelopment, creating more construction jobs during the development phase, and then putting these properties into long-term economic use, creating jobs and tax dollars long terms for the people of Washington State. That's a solution, I believe, that's a win-win for Washington, and that's going to be a major focus of our committee as we tear down that fund, put it back to the purposes it's supposed to be going to, and create jobs and opportunity and the communities we all want to live in all throughout Washington State. Um, conversion to liquid natural gas is going to be another major focus. Uh, next year, I'm going to be working very hard to create a public-private partnership to convert Washington State ferries to LNG. So no tax dollars paid for it. We don't need a gas tax to get it done. Private companies come in, do the retrofit. They make money on the back end with the difference between LNG and diesel uh, to convert those ferries over. And I believe once we do the cost-benefit analysis, once we actually do the scientific study, you will see that this conversion will have a greater impact on air quality and carbon emissions and many other programs that are currently being considered through the regulatory route uh, in Olympia. And I'm very excited about keeping the pressure on to get this done uh, in the upcoming year. And one of the parts we want to do is create a preferential rate structure. So there are places where the government can play a role uh, for a short period of time on the preferential rate structure for renewable natural gas. So what a selling point for Washington State to say not only are we doing it cost effectively with private sector solutions, but we're also using renewable natural gas in our ferries in Washington State. That's a great model that we could be building upon, and it's a solution for all of us. Um, another big one we'll be talking about this year, and keep me on my hook here with time, yeah. I want to be focused in on what we're going to be trying to get done is nuclear power. Um, Senator Sharon Brown out of the Tri-Cities is a major advocate and expert upon what we're doing. Senator Tim Sheldon, who is co-chair of the Energy Committee, is on the board for Energy Northwest. And so we'll be talking about nuclear power as a long-term solution to our energy needs, but not just about deployment in Washington State but talking about modular nuclear reactors as an export industry for Washington. And what converges in this particular issue is that Senator Brown chairs the Trade Committee, which I also sit on, uh, and also we have a Senator John Braun on the Trade Committee, so the members of our Energy Committee are also on the Trade Committee. And we're going to bring together this concept of we can not only be a leader in technology, we can be a leader 
in how we are able to export new technologies around the world and get a credit back on the carbon reductions that occur from modular nuclear reactors compared to other types of energy sources that might be available in third world countries and in other places. What a place where we could actually bring to fruition when we talk about trying to be the innovation state, actually do it and combine our export expertise into that particular area. Um, one last thing I want to close with, because I know my time is short, is this issue of language. You know, and um, my degree is in government, and I, I tend to spend a lot of time in the political world, but the power of language is so important how we do it. And every time I hear somebody say, uh, the environmental community, and Brandon knows about this all the time, I'm an environmentalist. My master's degree is in environmental policy. Uh, I know that Todd is an environmentalist. And so when we say the environmentalists want this, I would say, who crowned them the environmentalists? Because we're actually working on environmental solutions. So in front of my committee, we're very careful about how that term is utilized. The other place where we're seeing language used this year, and I'll close with this one, is the transformation of Governor Inslee into talking about uh, taxing our major carbon polluters uh, in Washington State. And so I got a call yesterday from a newspaper reporter asking me if I was scared of the recent Elway poll that said that 71% of Washington citizens support a tax on carbon polluters or big polluters. And I said, absolutely not. We just got done with a very large poll in November, and the people pretty overwhelmingly said no to tax increases. But if you ask the question, do you favor a tax increase on Washington State's 100 biggest polluters, and say yes or no, I mean, of course people are going to say, yes, I support taxing Washington's biggest polluters, 100, 100 polluters, more than other people. But you follow up the question, you say, you realize that your grandmother's that polluter when she puts gas in the car, and she's actually the biggest polluter in Washington state. Then all of a sudden, people think about it and say, no, that's not a good idea. Um, one of the problems we get into in politics that we'll be pushing back against is this concept of vilifying the energy industry that helps produce the quality of life that we want to have. And that's part of the language that we'll be fighting back against this year. So a lot of big issues, a lot of big solutions. Um, we're going to be focused on solutions to get things done to improve our life. And uh, we'll be working hard with all of you in the Washington Policy Center to get that done. Just one last quick plug. The Policy Center, I appreciate you being here because people don't always realize I have to invite the Policy Center to come down and testify in front of my committees. And when we ask them to do it, it's in a bi bipartisan, nonpartisan fashion to provide technical expertise and guidance to the legislature, and they do a phenomenal job of coming down with, uh, with good science in an understandable format that is very, very useful in the legislative process. So I appreciate what the Policy Center does. So what I learned most was is that gasoline is a buck 99 in uh, Senator Erickson's district. So Ferndale, is that right? You just proved my point. Yeah. <laughs> All right, second, we're going to uh, have uh, Brent, uh, Brendan Housekeeper. He um, is with the Association of Washington Business. He is their environmental policy expert. And the only thing I'll say about him by way of introduction is that he has a good pedigree because he used to work at the Washington Policy Center. Please welcome Brandon. Thanks, Todd. Um, so what I, my takeaway was is when I worked for the Policy Center, Doug liked it when I came before his committee. He used to invite me, now he doesn't invite me, he just tells me he's running legislation and we better like it. <laughs> so, uh, we're a little, little bit different role, I guess. Um, so I'm gonna, given that this is a, a solution summit, I'm gonna try and talk about a couple of, uh, an example of a solution that we're working on in Olympia. And, I, and I'm talking about it saying we're appreciative of the process that's taking place, although there's still many hurdles that we have to go through, although, I think process is really important for the broader business community that I represent. Um, we've heard a few things that I guess I just can't let go. Senator Erickson talked about language and, and the importance of the language that we use. Um, the governor's been out talking about polluters and saying po polluters need to pay or polluters should pay. Um, and those folks that he's uh, talking about are the employer community that I represent. We represent over 8,300 employers throughout the state of Washington that provide jobs and family wage jobs and contribute back to the community that we live in. Um, and so we prefer to talk about them as employers instead of polluters. And as a business community, what we're asking for, as I've gone throughout the state and talked with folks, as in Tri-Cities yesterday at the Solutions Summit and had a chance to meet with a lot of our members, I've talked with some of them even here this morning, and what they're looking for is certainty and regulation in part. That's one of the keys for them, is that they want certainty in regulation, and they want science-based regulation as well um, to drive that regulation. So there's an example that I just want to briefly talk with you about. 
Um, when I talk about it, it I'm not going to get into the weeds of it because everybody's eyes will gloss over. I've been working on it for the last three and a half years. It's human health water quality criteria standards for Washington. How many people know what that is? Have anybody heard of, like, thank goodness. Uh, what about fish consumption? Have you heard about fish consumption? Same thing. Um, unfortunately, I got the nomenclature of fish consumption because one small element of it is regarding how much fish people consume. But it sets the water quality standards, surface water quality standards for the state of Washington. Um, it's a federal regulation that's been delegated to the state of Washington that we have to maintain through the Clean Water Act. So I'm going to just give you a real brief history. Uh, many folks in the room will remember back in the 70s when the Clean Water Act was created, the kind of the impetus behind that was rivers catching on fire, um, stories like the Aaron Brockovich story, a real life story of, of pollution entering the environment unchecked. Um, and and those, were, those were real things. I think if, if you listen to what Todd talked about in the and kind of the, the structure that he talked about, that's maybe a time where we looked and we said, regulation, the Clean Water Act and what it provided, maybe had a purpose and a place at that time. But if we fast forward here in Washington State and we look at the makeup of our environment and where we're at as a state and what we're accomplishing, um, we have cleaner air today, we have cleaner water today than we had 20 years ago. And yet we have larger population masses moving here to the Puget Sound. Industry is continuing to grow in and around the state of Washington, and yet we have cleaner air and cleaner water, in, in part as a result of the Clean Water Act. Um, it, it came time for the state to update our, our, our water quality rules, so we've been going through this long, arduous process. There's a lot of stakeholders involved, and it was very controversial. There's elements of it that were controversial. The governor's office got involved in this. Governor Inslee inherited this, this policy debate, and the governor actually sat down and he called a group of us together around a kitchen table and said, I want to work with you and I want to understand this issue and I want to understand the science behind it. And we were able to, as a business community, go in with the other stakeholders around the table and tell our story and talk about what the Clean Water Act means, what it requires us to do, how we can continue to reduce pollution, and what we are going to be able to accomplish with this new update or next round of, of regulations that we're going to be put on us. And it was important that we had the opportunity to do that. And in doing that, the governor saw that we could continue to tighten the screws on the permitted community, the regulated community, and say, you need to do more to reduce the pollutants or the chemicals that you're putting into the environment. But he also realized that that came at a cost, that there was a disadvantage to continuing to follow the, the Clean Water Act's prescriptive path of doing that. Um, and, and so he listened to us on that. We did research that showed that new technologies that are available won't reduce the amount of, and I'll use the example of PCBs, it's been talked about a lot for those in, in the environmental community working on this issue. PCBs in the environment, if we introduce new technologies to continue to reduce PCBs, there's not a lot of low-hanging fruit left. There's very little PCBs left in the environment in the terms of what technology can, can reduce. We're not, as industry, we're not introducing uh, by choice, PCBs into the environment. There's some inadvertent creation of PCBs that takes place, but we've done all that we can do. And we said, and if we had, if we go forward, and we did a cost analysis and looked at the technology and said, if we implement the technology, we still won't have certainty that we'll be able to meet the permit requirements if you adopt a policy that requires us to implement that technology. The technology still isn't successful at reducing the rates of PCBs in the environment. And it will cost, it have extraordinary costs. So up in a place like Bellingham, up in, in uh, Senator Erickson's district, we looked at that and we said, well, what does that mean in real terms to people? Everybody pays utility rates. Most people throughout the state pay utility rates, stormwater rates to their local municipality where they have treatment facility centers. Bellingham had just instituted a new wastewater treatment facility. Their rate payers had, that, had the cost of expanding that and updating it into their system. Um, into their utility bills, and if they had to, if Bellingham, under the new regulations that were being considered, if Bellingham had to move forward and adopt this new technology and implement it on the ground, then their average rate payers' costs would go up by $200 per month in order to implement that technology, with no guarantee that Bellingham would be able to meet the outcomes that they needed to meet through their permit requirements. 
So we worked with the governor. We were able to explain that. The governor had some tough policy choices to make. We still don't understand the full implications of those choices he made other than to say we're, we're generally pleased with the direction that we're headed. We're still working through that. There's a long process still ahead of us. But the, I think the important part was it was a science-based driven approach where we were able to sit down and have an honest discussion. And I, and I think as I listen to Senator Erickson and knowing I'm going to be down there in Olympia and coming before him, the things that we're already having those conversations with Senator Erickson about all those issues that he touched, whether it's rail by oil or energy uh, issues in and around the state, those are the type of things that we're looking for help on. And we think that those are the ways that you get to real solutions that work for the employer community. Um, let me just say, un there is an unfortunate reality that we face too. When we went through the process, a big part of this is toxics reduction. It's, I think it ties right into what Senator Erickson was saying about climate change in that it's real easy for us to point at people, right? We've seen the pictures, the Department of Ecology still uses and, and shows uh, slide presentations where they have smokestacks or somebody with a straight pipe going out to a water body and they just portray it as industry is polluting and we need to somehow stop the pollution. But whether we're talking about toxics reductions or greenhouse gas emissions or whatever it might be, industry isn't the only one contributing to that. And so we need to have an honest dialogue and we can't just point the finger and call individual polluters. So the governor, as part of his water quality solution, says we need to do more to reduce toxics in the environment before they get introduced into the workplace. We said we agree with that. And so he came up with, uh, he came up with a plan for toxics reduction. It's a plan that would give the Department of Ecology authority to move forward in banning chemicals from commerce. We, uh, we're going to have to work through that process as well, and we're inviting the governor to sit at the table with us on toxics reduction or climate table and institute a process similar to water quality to look at the science, have regulatory certainty, and base those decisions on science. Look forward to your questions and conversation. Thank you. All right, last is uh, John Charles. He's the head of the Cascade Policy Institute, which is our a partner organization uh, based in Oregon. Uh, one of the great things about John and the reason I've had him at several of these uh, over the years is that he has been director of Cascade Policy for 18 years, but prior to that he was head of the Oregon Environmental Council for 15 years um, and saw the mistakes that the environmental left was making um, and joined the free market environmental movement and has a fantastic story to tell. And he's going to talk a little bit about that and about uh, Oregon's experience with environmental policy and green jobs. Please welcome John Charles. Thank you. Yesterday morning in Kennewick, I was actually the first speaker, but I went a little long. So I noticed a subtle shift in the lineup here today. <laughs> So I think the message is, if I go too long today, you'll just go off to lunch and I'll talk to an empty room. So uh, never underestimate the power of a moderator. I will try and keep it a little shorter today. Todd did ask me to, to talk about green jobs, which is kind of a vacuous phrase. It doesn't mean anything, of course, like much of the environmental terminology. Uh, which wouldn't really matter if it would just be an academic kind of discussion, except that many people who get elected to public office or many of the bureaucrats who work for them want to use the power of taxation and regulation to punish politically incorrect, uh, non-green job producing sectors and reward those that they think are preferred. And Oregon's done a, uh, has repeatedly over 30, 40 years made mistakes costing billions of dollars by trying to pick winners and losers. <clears throat> so I think at this, but at this point in the program, you're probably on data overload. So instead of burying you with a blizzard of statistics about our pathetic track record in Oregon, I'll, I'll actually tell a story from another century that'll just be a cautionary tale, and uh, I find it interesting, so I, I hope you will as well. And it's, it's, just, it's, a, it's a story about the limits of central planning and the limits of knowledge, even by people who, especially by people who are highly trained. Uh, and that is that in the 19th century, living in urban, any urban center was risky uh, because of cholera outbreaks. And all of the experts in the mid-19th century <clears throat> were convinced that cholera was an airborne disease caused by the fact that most urban centers, because of so much uh, animal 
and human waste um, and discharge and just the density, they were very smelly places, especially in the summertime. A place like London, if you had enough money to flee London in the summer, you would because the stench was just overwhelming. And so people constantly, all the medical experts and all of the public health experts were convinced they had this miasma theory, this miasma of human and animal waste and density was causing people to die of cholera. Well, a gentleman named Edwin Chadwick, who was a bureaucrat in the city and later went on to become known as the father of the modern public health movement, <clears throat> he was a key believer in this and uh, he, he was in favor of sewering the city uh, because of all the, all the cesspools that were making neighborhoods so uh, disgusting. And you might have thought that would be a green jobs program because sewering does sound like a good thing, except that this isn't you know, modern sewering. This is dump collecting from households and transporting to the Thames River untreated waste and dumping it into the water, thereby killing a thriving salmon fishery and poisoning a bunch of people who, who use the river for their drinking water source. So under his orders in the 1840s, uh, he started sewering, and each time the sewer extended, he poisoned more people. S Stephen Johnson, in his fascinating book, The Ghost Map, which discusses this, notes, well, the first defining act of a modern centralized public health authority run by, quote, experts, was to poison an entire urban population. So for more than 30 years, the medical establishment, all the doctors and public health people were convinced that cholera was an airborne disease, and every kind of cure was proposed. Opium, linseed oil, castor oil, brandy. None of them worked. Dr. John Snow, a private practitioner, actually published a paper in 1939 proposing uh, the notion that it was a waterborne disease. Well, he was considered a kook, a nut. Obviously, he wasn't with the program. So in 1855, as another cholera outbreak uh, began, Dr. Snow, at great risk to himself, <clears throat> went to a neighborhood where people were dying and went door by door and interviewed hundreds of households to try and figure out where they were getting their water from. And he eventually pinpointed a public water pump on Broad Street that was a likely source of the contamination. As it turns out, there was a leaking underground cesspool that contaminated. So, he arranged to have the pump handle removed so people couldn't use it, and cholera outbreak dissipated. But the experts, his fellow doctors, uh, continued to think of him as a kook because people who were living at higher ground um, didn't suffer from the outbreak, so obviously they had better air up there, and so air was continuing to be the solution, clean air. Well, a local priest, Reverend uh, Henry Whitehead, <clears throat> was one of the people who believed that Dr. Snow was wrong, and he actually set out to prove him wrong. But the more he looked at the evidence, the more he concluded Dr. Snow was actually correct. And the two of them worked together to eventually get the medical establishment to, to understand that this was a waterborne disease. So it's interesting that a priest, a man of faith, not known for examining empirical evidence, examined the evidence and concluded Dr. Snow was correct and this was a waterborne disease. All the public health professionals and medical professionals, people uh, trained to interpret data, they're the ones who treated this as a religious conversation and couldn't get to the right conclusion. So <clears throat> Dr. John Stephen Johnson in his book, he, he notes, quote, so often what is lacking in many of these explanations and prescriptions is some measure of humility, some sense that the theory being put forward is still unproven. It's not just that the authorities of the day were wrong about miasma. It's the tenacious, unquestioning way that they went about being wrong. So I think of this all the time in these conversations uh, about the kinds of issues that come before uh, the senator here. Uh, well, peak oil, yeah, that <clears throat> people were convinced for decades that peak oil was going to happen, and, and um, gee, that, that didn't seem to work out. Uh, global warming, and uh, let's ban plastic bags, let's do this, let's do that, and they're constantly wrong. So my advice in all of these issues, especially to people who are elected or appointed officials and have the power to tax and regulate, um, is don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> Doing nothing, first do no harm, okay? That's usually the best thing. The economy itself will work its way out. We don't need interventions. They're usually wrong. 
Thank you. I assumed that I was putting you at cleanup. <laughs> that was why I put you last. Uh, one, one thing to add on uh, to what you were talking about is, is that it's the, the people who make the best decisions are people who have skin in the game. And so I gave that example of the beekeepers. They have skin in the game. If they don't get it right, they lose money. They have to find a solution that works. And if they're committed to an ideology that doesn't work, it costs them. And so they will adapt rapidly. If you, are, if you don't have skin in the game, then you can maintain sort of a belief in a particular ideology and never pay the cost of it. And in fact, the irony is that what we see in environmental policy is that the more radical you are, the more it shows your commitment to the cause, even if that doesn't actually help the environment. And so the perverse incentive that we often see is people make bad decisions in politics because bad decision making shows that you're committed to the cause. Anybody can make a good decision. It's only the truly committed who can make a bad decision. And, and you laugh, but it, I see it all the time in how people talk about environment and, and a variety of other uh, political issues as well. All right, with that, uh, we have some time for questions. Um, so we have a, a person back here who has a microphone, so go ahead and please speak into the microphone. They'll come find you. Yes, sir. Todd, we've heard a lot about the 100 biggest polluters in the state of Washington. Is there a list of the 100 biggest polluters? And do you think Governor Butch Otter in Idaho has that list and he's making phone calls today? So there, there are two that he'll have difficulty getting, and that's UW and Wazoo. But the others... Yeah, so there, there is a list. It's 130 uh, is what the governor has cited. So it's anyone who emits more than 25,000 metric tons of, of emissions per year. And there's a list, and interesting enough, Governor Otter spoke yesterday in Tri-Cities at the Policy Summit, at the Solutions Summit there, and he reminded folks, he asked who got his letter, and a lot of people raised their hands, and he says, good, you'll be getting another one. So, I mean, yeah, that's, it's a, it's a real fear, though, right? I mean, when you talk about these types of policies, industry has choices to make, right? And, and a real choice that some in industry can make, I'm thinking of one company that's on that list that has operations in Washington and Montana. There's capital costs, there's choice, I mean, there's just simply choices they can make, and at what point do they say, you know, it's easier to do what we're doing from Montana than from Washington? And they'll leave a community that relies heavily upon their high-paying jobs, right? I mean, so, Again, they're, and they pay a price for pollution. Everybody who operates has air permits. Everybody who operates is meeting some rule or regulation. So they're already paying, they're already conforming to rules and regulations and meeting standards and doing their work. The question is more, what are the rest of us gonna do? Senator Erickson talked about it. Uh, you know, when grandma puts gas in her car, she's contributing to the problem, or at least the perceived problem. So. So yeah, it's a, it, Governor Otter has already made the joke and said he's sending a second letter here soon to people, and, and I won't be surprised if some businesses don't seriously consider his offer. One additional point that I'll make is in the governor's cap and trade bill, he actually has a fund that he says for industries that might be affected by competition from out of state. So he says that he recognizes this and addresses it. What's interesting is, is that when he his press conference when he announced cap and trade, he said, the reason we have cap and trade is we don't want some bureaucrat picking and choosing winners and losers in terms of who wins in Washington state. But if you look at the fund that he's created, who decides who gets the fund to offset the costs of that out of state competition? The Department of Ecology. So I mean, it, the very thing he says he doesn't want to do is exactly what's in his bill. Next question. Yes, sir. Second person back, yeah, wait, let's go ahead and wait for the microphone. What is the likelihood that this cap and trade is going to go through as it stands? Well, you know, we never want to uh, predetermine legislation. What the Governor Inslee has, has promised is to create a Washington-specific solution 
um, that takes into account our unique energy portfolio in Washington. So we'll wait and see what uh, Governor Inslee is able to work with House Democrats uh, to be able to produce this year uh, in terms of cap and trade or carbon tax legislation. And then we'll give it a full hearing in the Senate if they're able to get it out of the House. So. Um, we'll see. We're still waiting to see some of the plans come forward. It is getting a little late in the game. And I will say this also, Governor Inslee went through a process. We had the, the clue process, and some people didn't like the results of that process, so they formed their own process in the executive branch. Um, if you read page one of their executive summary, the first thing they say is that any taxes generated through cap and trade or carbon tax should be put back into impacted industries to help them. Um, that was the one consensus everybody agreed upon. If you look at some of the proposals Governor Inslee has put out, he has a new 40-40-20 split, which says 40% for education, 40% for roads, and 20% for um, low-income families. It's down to 10%. Well, whatever, 10% according to the most recent one. I haven't got that memo yet today. So the point I'm making, though, is even if we do get something out, we have to go and redo all of the economic analysis that's already been done to try and gauge what the, the impact would really be. So um, I would say a year was wasted by eliminating the clue process and using the go it alone policy through the executive branch and now even throwing out all of the research done in that process with the ability apparently is going to try to have introduced. All right, there was another question over here. Yeah, go ahead. Back to me up here. Just <laughs> the latest and short answers. Thank you. Um, my question is about marrying uh, the benefits of transportation investments with environmental benefits. Can you share your thoughts on how we can target transportation investments to not only reduce congestion, but also redu uh, reduce the carbon from congestion, uh, increase water quality, and increase uh, the fish habitat through the culvert replacement? Anyone? 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 Senator Bueller? Transportation is something I've worked on pretty extensively for, for 20 years, and I would say in a city the size of, of Seattle or Portland, if, if, especially on, on highways, on limited access highways, if traffic congestion is what you're trying to solve, there really is only one way to do it, and that would be through the use of electronic tolling and peak hour pricing, congestion pricing, where everywhere that time of day pricing um, or seasonal pricing is used everywhere else in the economy, it works. But congestion pricing is very unpopular. Um, I think there's probably some experimentation with electronic tolling going on in Seattle. Portland, we're way behind the times. We'll do it after 49 other states do it. Um, and when you have traffic going in free flow conditions, you have a lot of other benefits in terms of less energy consumption, less air pollution. Not that I consider CO2 to be an air pollutant. It's, I'm indifferent to it. But um, some people think it's important. <clears throat> and then your transit ridership would probably go up as well because any kind of bus, buses stuck in traffic, suddenly they become express bus uh, type service at basically no cost to, to bus riders. So that's the theoretically best way to do it is a better road-based transit and congestion pricing, but it's, that's very difficult to sell politically, so people prefer to waste a lot of money on um, steel wheel transit and um, other things that don't work, uh, transit-oriented development. And um, at some point, you look for cities to experiment. When things get really bad enough, the failure is bad enough, then maybe you'll switch. And uh, there, are, there are cities uh, and, and specific highways the, that have used peak hour pricing for 20 years, and it's, and it's worked. And gradually, that will seep in. And it'll be like the cholera discussion. Eventually, people will figure out that this works. But most cities, leaders don't want to be the first one in. Really quick on that one, um, culvert removal and replacement um, should be a capital budget item also. Um, it's, a, it's an overall good, and we had a program we put in place, I, I've been here too long apparently, in 1998 when I worked at Fish and Wildlife. Um, unfortunately, over the years, that fund uh, has been stolen to go out and purchase property. Instead of addressing the issue, that money has been used to purchase private property, take it off the tax rolls. So we have to go back and take a look at the original salmon enhancement um, programs we had in place focus the dollars back into the culvert replacement and repair. Uh, the second one is, and I'll probably get something thrown at me by somebody for saying this one, um, but I want to follow up with Kurt, Senator King, which is that um, local transit is a, a local issue, and the state has a responsibility for moving people between regions. And one of the things I've always said is, if I want to get somebody out of their car, I need to give them a better option. And so if we want to talk about big solutions, big ideas, being the world leader in something, why don't we get back to, and maybe this may or may not work, let's do a cost-benefit analysis of high-speed rail that actually gives me an option to go from Vancouver, B.C. to Vancouver, Washington, Seattle to Spokane in a timely way. 
uh, gives me an option to get out of my car. And funny one, I'll be quick here, we were giving each other a hard time on short answers. When I go, I have a very diverse district. When I'm in Bellingham and I say, wouldn't it be great if you could get on a train, go to a Mariners game and come home the same night? Everybody says, yeah, it'd be a great idea. I go to Linden, which is probably the most conservative part of Washington State, and I say, wouldn't it be great to be able to get on a train, go to a Mariners game and come back that same night? They say, yeah, it'd be a great idea. But in Linden, they ask how you're going to pay for it. In Bellingham, they don't care. Um, so that's the rub that we get to on how you can make something like that work, and can we as a state? Is it fiscally possible in our current permitting system? And it opens up this whole can of worms with regards to how do I get a whole new right-of-way system to put in that type of a network which would give people an option to not use their car, which I think people would love to see, but, you know, cracking that egg and making that omelet, uh, building new infrastructure in an already built out environment is the single hardest thing you can do. And that's what makes you wonder, do we have the ability as a state to do big things? Or do we just have the ability to do all these things around the fringes which are going to penalize people long term and limit their mobility and not enhance their mobility going forward? Uh, the fish culverts is a good example of the role of economic development in helping the environment, how those go hand in hand. There are four central agencies or four organizations that have responsibility for replacing fish culverts. Private sector, state trust lands, which we harvest for timber, uh, the Department of Transportation, and federal lands. The private sector and the state trust lands are ahead of schedule on replacing fish culverts because every time they did a timber harvest, they would fix it. They had a stream of revenue coming in. The Department of Transportation and the federal government are way behind because they don't have a stream of revenue coming in. They have to rely on budgeting. And so when you put economic value with environmental value, you get better environmental results. Mm -hmm. Next question. I saw a question over here. Senator Erickson, uh, Paul Shakovsky with Bloomberg Bureau of National Affairs. Um, Governor Inslee had a fairly large tent, which Brandon alluded to with regard to the, uh, uh, the uh, human health criteria and fish consumption standards. Um, um, in that large tent uh, were the tribes, and he managed to piss them off mightily with his solution um, to altering the algorithm by which the human health uh, criteria are, are um, calculated. Um, Given that he's had this large tent, that apparently AWB is on board, uh, how do you see the Republican Senate responding to his overall package, which includes upstream toxic reduction? Upstream taxes? For Tox to toxic. Toxic. Sorry. Okay. Gotcha. I do like hearing you say the Republican Senate. By the way, that's my bias. Um, it's a crazy place here in Washington to have that Republican controlled Senate. We're making it a priority in Washington State. You know, my personal belief is I want to get as much of this out of the system as we possibly can as quickly as we can. That's what I'm going to drive forward to try to get accomplished. Now, one of the problems we get into, like the flame retardant issue, when I mandate you put it in on one side and mandate you can't have it on the other side, how does a business operate in that particular situation? With regards to fish consumption, we're going to bring the numbers back and actually have a good study that shows the fish that we're eating, how is it impacted, how is a, uh, a perch caught in the Columbia River different than a salmon caught that spends its life in Alaska. But that's kind of the outside. But the goal has to be how can we do it better in Washington State. The other trick is going to be how do we not also at the same time become an island. And so when I go to buy something at a store, everything says not available in Washington State. Or I'm driving industry to Idaho to export things across with the same environmental impacts, putting it into a stream in Idaho, which then flows into Washington. So this is one of the things, I think, where we have to hopefully depoliticize, look for solutions that work, and not be so extreme. And one of the things that we happen, so you have a measurement that you can't obtain. And this is the problem we saw early. When, when I create standards that are not obtainable, by industry, it becomes kind of a, a joke going forward. If the technology doesn't, I have, a, I have a standard I can't meet, and the technology does not exist to measure to that standard, what's the point of doing that? And is that the best environmental bang for our buck? But we're going to be very focused on this issue this year. It's a very important one that I'm going to be uh, personally spending a lot of time working on. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yes and no. There's a bunch of different moving pieces in there. My big concern, and I'll be very specific, is rulemaking authority for the Department of Ecology. And I personally believe that we should not be granting broad-based rulemaking authority to the Department of Ecology in this particular issue. And when Governor Inslee says that we need to grant them rulemaking authority because of overreach at the federal level based upon rulemaking authority that was given to EPA, to me that doesn't make sense. 
right, in terms of how we move forward. So the legislative branch needs to maintain control and broad-based grants of authority to the Department of Ecology will not be in the best interest of, of environmental protection, to be honest with you. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, go back here, sorry. Uh, Senator Erickson, uh, were you the target of the stayer money, the senator? <laughs> no? Oh, well, you know, I, I got lots of big fan club from the last election cycle. It's not politics here today, but um, one of the interesting parts as we move forward and watch, yeah, yes, is the answer. I mean, they, they dumped Well, well then I have bucks. a question for you. <laughs> does, does Steyer know you're an environmentalist? Well, you know, um, I might not be that far up on his radar screen, but interesting part about public opinion, which is uh, Mr. Steyer and his, his dollars went into my district and dumped a million dollars of targeted mail on oil by rail and all these different issues. And the more he spent, <laughs> the higher my percentage went up which I thought was kind of interesting in terms of what the public is thinking out there in terms of what they want to see happen. When you live in it and you see it and you see the good things we're doing and you get these out of state pieces that try to claim we're going down a different pathway, the people are figuring it out. And that's why they want good, solid environmental, that's my political speech, we asked about Steyer, so yes and no and he doesn't. <laughs> we have time for one more question, go ahead. Am I on? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, we used to have aluminum plants in our state because of cheap electricity. Now, uh, they don't have that anymore. Is there a chance? We, we, we produce enough wasted aluminum from cans to re recycle to do a mile a day of, uh, or more than a mile a day of new tra technology transportation. So uh, do, can you, anybody recollect about aluminum, why it's not being manufactured here? Well, that'd be right up my alley. We have an aluminum smelter up in Whatcom County, my district. I'm, I live about four miles from it. Um, so our aluminum industry for many years was the beneficiary of that cheap power. And the people of Washington State were actually beneficiaries of the aluminum industry taking all the surplus power that the dams were producing during off-peak hours. So it was a great relationship that we had in Washington State between the industry and the energy we were producing. In, 19, or in 2001, with the energy crisis and the skyrocketing price of the mid-Columbia fuel prices and world markets, um, many of the aluminum smelters throughout Washington State closed down permanently. Goldendale, Spokane, uh, Vancouver are, are never coming back online. Currently, we have um, Alcoa purchased the plants that were here. So we have Alcoa and Talco Works in Ferndale and Alcoa Wenatchee Works in the uh, Wenatchee area, who are very important, successful, profit-making arms of Alcoa right now. So those industries are still kicking, and they do still take advantage of the um, low-cost hydro uh, still available in Washington State. Wenatchee, uh, more than Ferndale, because Wenatchee has a direct link to Chelan, I think it's Chelan PUD, uh, the dam right there on site. So Ferndale is different in terms of how we structure that energy. And by the way, we also have a tax incentive package, uh, which is expiring this year for the aluminum industry in Washington State that we're going to be trying to re-up to keep those, uh, those jobs here in Washington. Yeah, so what happened in 2001, you remember the energy crisis, rates spiked, um, and industries, uh, energy intensive industries left. Um, that's one of the concerns about actually cap and trade is that you look at everywhere cap and trade has been, they have these big spikes in prices and then a crash. So what happens, how do industries deal with that variability of cap and trade? I think mm -hmm. it's an open question. Yeah. So thank you very much. Let's give one more uh, round of applause for our speakers.